stuff. I know we're going to be encroaching on our two o'clock, but let's get some let's get some real talking done here. Um, start with you, Brett. So this is I'd like to know from what deep recesses of your mind did you pull out that project? Because it's really good. Yeah, it wasn't that deep actually. It was right at the forefront. <laughs> Talk to us about that. Uh, so the the film is based on. Uh, or the, the idea for the film came from my wife and I's experience with miscarriage. Um, the first time when we were trying to start our family and we got pregnant for the first time, uh, we miscarried and had just no preparation or expectation that that could or would happen and it, it really threw us for a loop and then we took a lot of time and healed from that but then when we got pregnant again, all of a sudden we realized that we were kind of hedging our bets the whole time. We were living fear. under this umbrella of fear that that yes. could happen again. And so uh, it took us a while again to, what we thought we'd already worked through kind of came right back at us. And, and we had to figure out how to open ourselves up to hope and be excited and start to do all the fun things kind of without reservation anymore. Um, kind of open ourselves up fully to happiness even if something bad had happened again. Okay, first of all, it's, it's very gracious of you to share that with us. Second is, the to me, now I'm getting better at the symbolism of stepping through the black hole at the end and coming through to the other side. I had sort of thought that was the case, um, but you're articulating it, which I think makes it easier for me to sort of grasp the, the, the closure here. And you have a child now? Yeah, so we actually have three now. Oh, uh, boy. We, <laughs> had, we had our second, uh, we were pregnant with our second when I was writing the film. <laughs> we were kind of going through the whole thing all over again. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so our second, who's two now, was born uh, just a, a, like a month and a half before we shot the film. And then now we have a third, uh, we have a three-month-old little girl now, so we have two boys and a girl right now. Okay, how about a little round of applause? Yeah. 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 It has a lot to do with filmmaking as a mode of closure, you know, or trying to put things out there that really sort of codify what you've walked through as a couple. Yeah, so, and, and congratulations for the whole team, well really, done. for the whole team, it was really a part of the process. Um, uh, my cinematographer lost his sister to cancer while we were prepping the film, and then my producer uh, lost her younger brother to a, an overdose, uh, and we, we pushed the film because of that. It was it was right before we were going to shoot, and we pushed it till longer, and so we were all kind of dealing with these losses, okay. and all supporting each other, and, and kind of all supporting each other on the themes of the story that we were telling, that we could be happy, you know, we could, all, could move on with hope after that. Uh, you worked with AFI on this, right? You were enrolled at the time when you made, made the film. Yeah, yeah so I did the, the, the master's directing program at AFI, and this was my thesis film. Your thesis program. film, yeah. yeah. So when you presented that, was it, how was it received in, in terms of your peers also? Was it very well regarded at the time? Because we, we certainly thought it was terrific, it was tremendous. But what it, how, how was it perceived at the time? I mean, and most of, I don't know much about the AFI process versus other universities or colleges. Yeah, yeah. The, it was uh, it was really interesting. The AFI program is your you apply to a certain track, and then you're in that track the whole time. So I applied to the directing. I was in the directing track. So the whole time you're directing, as opposed to other grad schools where you kind of do a little bit of everything. So there's there's directing students, there's cinematography students, and there's writing students. Right. And for the thesis process, you have to pitch your idea and anybody can pitch an idea to the student body um, and then you try and get people to sign on to your project and then once you kind of get a full team signed on you're greenlit to move forward with the process so I had to pitch the, the idea to the school um, and I did that over Zoom during COVID okay. and then uh, had some wonderful people join onto the team who felt connected to the, the material and then it got even further connected as we went along um, and then uh, we went on to uh, produce the film together and make the film and then uh, it's, uh, but, but we were delayed because of COVID, and so it's, uh, I guess to answer your question, it wasn't, uh, it didn't have a great opportunity to show the rest of the school the finished film. <laughs> because of that, we all kind of finished during COVID and then have, uh, have separated. So we did have a screening at AFI, and, it's, uh, and I got some wonderful comments from my peers about it. One of the actors I recognize, I think, is it Corey Ellis? Is that his name? Uh -huh, yeah. yeah, so he's the last two seasons on Law & Order SVU. Yeah, he, yeah, he's had a, a, a recurring guest star role on SVU. Yeah. And then uh, Charlie, who plays uh, the wife in the film, she 
uh, was in the Jesus Revolution film, if you saw that, and she was also in 80 for Brady recently. So she actually- She was in 80 for Brady. She was in 80 for Brady, yeah. She, uh, she had to take a, during one of our lunch breaks, she was auditioning for one of those films. <laughs> Well, those are two she's sort of very good actors for you, which I think, did that help the process because they were able to delve deeply and just go for it in this, in this role? Yeah, they brought, uh, they brought so much. I really wanted, to, my philosophy as a director is always to like get people um, who are gonna surprise you and who are gonna bring new ideas in, in every role. You want people who are better than you in every aspect of the process. Um, and so uh, with Corey, I'd seen, or with Charlie, I'd seen her in a music video uh, a couple years before that, and I kind of kept her in a file of people, and I, I almost tried casting her in a different project, and then when this one came around, um, I reached out to her, and she said, oh, I don't do student films anymore, but you can send me the script. And uh, so I sent her the script, and then she responded and said, I'd love to do this film. So then we had her audition, and uh, we'd, uh, we'd auditioned a ton of people for it, and she just really brought a lot of, of fire and a lot of spark to the character, um, that was surprising that I hadn't seen, that I hadn't written on the page, and she brought so much to that. Um, and then uh, Corey, I'd seen him uh, in a feature film that one of my other AFI directors uh, directed uh, called A Place in the Field, and he was outstanding in that, and so I had them read together, and they just both kept each other on their toes so well that they were always, they had to be reacting earnestly because they were, they would both throw things at each other unexpectedly and just keep each other going. Mm. Thank you for that. It's a very good explanation. Um, what's, what's coming up next for you? Well, I have a feature film script that is kind of the feature version of this story. It's a little bit different and adapted as a feature, uh, but it's dealing with those same uh, themes and, and same experiences that my family had, and so that's the, the next big project. So we're kind of coming to a close of our festival run with Black Hole, and then moving into raising money for the feature film, which takes place on a potato farm in southern Idaho. So we're hoping to shoot it next September in southern Idaho during the potato harvest time. Okay. And so that's the next project. Good, good luck with it. When it's done, please give us a chance to look at it. It'll be your first feature. Absolutely. We'd like to have a look at it. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's turn to our co-editors on what I consider to be one of the richest films we have. And for those of you who are here and didn't leave, um, we'll try and get to the audience in just a minute uh, for questions. Uh, this, to me, looked like, A, the editor's, like, you die and go to heaven with this, and also the editor's nightmare, because, right, because there's so much movement in this film, and the editing is absolutely crucial to this film at the same time. I don't want you to speak for the directors, but I do want you to shed whatever light you can on working with Sarah and Till, getting this film in shape. So what were the key moments that you think were turning points in putting something so complex and rich together? Now, I hope this question isn't too deep, you know, in several parts, but take a shot and let us know. Um, for, first, I just want to thank you. Simeon Hunter, ladies and gentlemen. First, I just want to thank you for, for uh, taking the film and, and for um, your perseverance, kind of you were asking me about the film. And we did have a process. Yeah. And um, uh, I really appreciate it. And showing Welcome. here uh, is really a treat. Um, uh, you know, and I also wanted to say that there's another film here, um, also about an artist yeah. um, who's also 80 years old. Um, that was made by Alex um, Rappaport. I think he's. Are you here, Alex? Right. With Peter Bradley, we screened it on the right here last night. With with, with Peter Bradley and yes. and both of the, they're they're similar in a way because both these they're very different films, but the, the characters are similar in a way because um, they're both ex paint every day, yes. and and they're they're most comfortable working, and 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 that's true. It's definitely true with with Nikki. Um, and one thing I just want to say about him that it doesn't come across uh, as much in the film is that he helps other artists uh, in, in New York. Um, and he's, he's really well known in the community. Um, so in addition to being like an unbelievable artist, um, he's also really supportive of other artists. Um, and in terms of the process, I, I got, first got involved with it in 2020. Um, they, had, they kind of came to me with a partially finished uh, reel um, that they wanted to submit to HBO. So I, I worked on that. Um, for maybe four to six weeks, and then we submitted it to HBO, and they really liked it. But they wanted to see other scenes, 
So in 2021, it worked on this more and cut uh, a whole number of scenes, some of which were the basis for scenes that are in the, in the, in the film, still in the film. Um, and, and that's, and then HBO just, they, they watched it and 10 minutes later, I got a call from Till and Sarah, I was actually up here, uh -huh. and they said HBO wants, wants, oh, to, right. wants to go with it. So, right. so it was great that they, that they went with it, and it, was, it made everything, like really the, the process much easier because it's funded you know, from the get-go. Okay. Um, but still, this was really the most difficult film I, I think I've ever worked on. Ah, that's sort of what I'm interested in hearing. Yeah. And give us reasons. And, well, the reasons for it, I mean, you can see all the elements that, that have gone into it. There, there's a lot, a lot of historical. That's right. It's a historical film. Um, there's a huge amount of, of archival material. Um, it's a personal film. Um, and it gets into to, to, to Sarah's rela you know, relationship with her Deep father, with, with her mother, uh, her parents' relationship with each other. Um, and it's, there's just a lot there. Um, and so one of the biggest challenges that, that, that I had initially and <laughs> that we had um, was, was structuring it so that it, it made sense that we could, we could really uh, tell each of the story of each, each of those elements um, in, in, a, in, a, in a good way that made sense and it was, it was compelling. From the very beginning, uh, um, even with this, the, the trailer in the 20 minute trailer that, that, that we had, the search for the paintings was yes. spine. That's the through film. line. That's the through line. Yes, for sure. And that was all, that was the case from the beginning. Um, and then the, all these other stories kind of, we, we shaped them around that. So I was, there was, there are a lot of other, there's more footage that, that, that I was editing, a lot of other footage, a lot of other scenes. And that was part of the challenge. You, you know, you think that if we, these guys were, you know, Till and, and Sarah, they're super talented, and, and Till's a very good shooter, and they had, and these are great subjects, and they had so much material with, with Nikki and, and with Nahid, and um, it was tough because there was so much to edit, and um, I actually was working so hard that I, I got ill, you know, and, and I had to leave the project after a year um, because I, had, I was basically just working around the clock on it. Um, and Gretchen had come on, and they're also making another film at the same time, uh, believe it or not, about their kids. And Gretchen had started off editing that, editing, putting, starting to put that film together while I was working on, on this film. Um, and then uh, she came on as an assistant uh, editor initially. Um, and there was just so much to do that I, we asked her, to, I started giving her material to, to edit and she was doing a fantastic job. And she also had just terrific ideas about the structure. Um, and so we, we worked for a year and, and, built, and built the film up um, right. and got a pretty strong rough cut. So, 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 so using the theme that he brought up, that Simeon's brought up, which is this is historical, it's political, it's personal, and you're asked to jump into that after he's already done a considerable amount of work. You know, how did you? You know, how are you able to sort of keep it going, keep your the editing momentum going? Right. Well, I mean, by the time that Simeon had to step off, we had like a three-hour rough okay. cut, which you know, it's not unusual for a rough cut to be longer than a finished film, but it was clear that we, you know, we had to make some tough choices, and so. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that it was, uh, what, the other person I want to mention as part of the process is Lindsay Utz, who is an amazing editor, um, who came on as a consultant um, and spent, we did like a few months together remotely and then we spent like a week together, like really working hard. And it was, it was the same film, but we really had to bring it down to kind of like the bare bones and then build it back up again. Um, so three hours, this is a 90 minute film, so right. three hours became what initially, and then, or, or was it? Three, what? we cut the three hours down to like 80 minutes. Oh, and then it that's severe. Came, yeah, it was. <laughs> it needed it. Though. This is, yeah, I mean, this is the thing though, is, you know, it already, it is so rich, it's so complex, and, you know, when you're watching, I feel like there's so many things to try and follow and absorb and understand. Hopefully we did a good job that you're following along. But you know, there's so much more in real life, in, and all the footage they shot. There was so much more we could have included. So many other, so many other things that happened. But we really needed to also think of 
the viewer <laughs> in this and like what are you going to come away and like you know what's realistic so yes. it was um but i i think if we hit a good balance in the end and Very like Shinian so. said many of the best scenes of the film were there in the real to begin with and we just needed to make sense of them and uh yeah, it was a very challenging project, for yeah. sure. <laughs> oh, well, I, I would just say congratulations. It's an extremely um, satisfying experience. I don't think there's much downtime in watching this, this film, because either you're witnessing history, the footage, by the way, of the revolutionary footage is extraordinary, um, and or the politics of Nicky Najumi himself, who he keeps front and center during this whole film, or the personal relationship, which you touched on between a uh, husband and wife, now divorced, or the daughter, who's obviously moved by her father's sort of almost inability to say much after all these years. He finally gives some of it away. Um, it's just it's terrific. I just applaud you. Let, let's go to the audience. There's got to be some questions. Yeah. At the beginning of the film, there's all the, all the voices are distended. There's no one speaking interview on camera. And in fact, you identify some people with lower third Chicago to say who's talking. And then about, I would say, maybe halfway through, then you cut to people, more traditional on-camera interviews. Was it ever your intention to do it solely without on-camera without on -camera interviews, or were you always planning on doing that? And that, because I, I just noticed that jump about 30 minutes in. I think the choice that was, that was made eventually, everybody was on camera, I mean, like, on screen originally. And it was, again, it was like a, it was a choice that we had to make because, you know, that's kind of the standard, what you would expect. It's a little easier for people to understand who's talking, where they're coming from. But um, the choice that we made, it was actually about, you know, if somebody is just speaking as an expert but doesn't have a role in the film itself, that we weren't going to put them on camera because it really became a little bit cluttered and like hard to follow and we really wanted people to stay kind of in this very intimate space with the main characters. So that was kind of what that was about. We did eventually, you know, you yeah. see um, uh, Shoja who was at the, at the show, and but he's really speaking from the first person. He's not just some art expert weighing in on, you know, whether on Nikki's paintings or something. So that was kind of more of the choice. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's interesting to, again, to compare this with Alex's film, um, uh, because, um, you know, Alex, you, you chose not to have any experts at all, and the more traditional route it is to have people on, on, on screen. I think this is kind of a way, it's kind of a, in between, kind of, we have, we hear their voices and they can, they can kind of explain um, who Nick, you know, Nikki's art, um, and, and yet we don't. We're not doing a traditional, um, you know, talking head interview. Okay. And we really wanted, uh, we wanted his artwork. I think that's the other thread. When you're talking about all the threads we had to work with, his, I mean, I can't, he does paint 12 hours a day, every single day of his life. It's incredible. Seven much, days a week. Seven days a week for the last, you know, 70 he, years. He and Peter Bradley should get to know each other. <laughs> so, but, so we had this incredible arc, like, so much work to pull from, but that can be a double-edged sword as an editor. It's like yes. you have just so so. We I actually after you stepped away, one of the steps of the process was that I and Sarah sat together for a week solid, just looking at paintings and talking about where they could go and you know what what the right moments were and you know and of course she's very attached. <laughs> Many of these paintings are of her moments in her life, so. Let's, uh, let's take one more question. Go ahead, Wayne. Then we have to clear because our next movie at two against all enemies. People are lining up out there already. So let's go ahead, Wayne. Uh, the missing piece for me was uh, the period in his life where he couldn't get any of his artwork shown, and then there seems to be a resurrection. It's not clear what the arc of that resurrection. He did it gradually build, or was it just one show at some point? Do you have any uh, any shed light on that? There actually was one show at, at one point at, at, at Pierogi in, in, in Brooklyn, um, and that was one of the elements I think got, kind of got condensed in the, in, the, in the process. But he did have a show there um, after all these rejections, um, and they they were featuring his work in, in the you know, storefronts, you know, in the windows as you walk as you walk by, and that kind of I think that kind of set 
set the stage for his the, the future and for his future work to be more recognized. But that really wasn't until the early 2000s. So yeah. we're really talking about a twenty like a twenty year period where he's producing work every day, and it is really true. Yeah, what was their textile design uh, activity? Can you go to say that was really like that? a commercial textile was, studio? Yeah, she she uh, Nahid had set up a, a textile design studio with a partner. Um, and they to make money, yeah. and that's how they made money for for some years. Um, right. And they brought Nick Nicky in, and he was fantastic at it. Uh, but he hated it because yeah. it was commercial work. But but they relied on that for their for their income. Okay, well, I'd like to have everybody give these folks one more round of applause. Thank you for coming.